Stu Pandis, everybody, thank you so much for joining us on Cyber Judo tonight. We really appreciate it. Tonight's a really fun session because I'm going to be talking about IoT security. We're going to be talking about some of the elements of why IoT security is important and to whom it's important, like consumers, enterprises, device creators, as well as talking about some of the initial fundamental components getting started with IoT pen testing. IoT is a really interesting domain because it spans such a wide breadth of domains and knowledge and expertise because it's not always the same thing. You know, when it comes to talking about, for example, web applications, a web application is a web application is a web application. But if we take the term and we have it pulled back by just one frame of reference and say application, there are so many different types of applications. You got web applications, you may have thick client applications and thin client applications. Those applications might be uh, not just coded in different languages, right, but compiled in different ways for different platforms and different architectures, which means it requires different tools and technologies, all that kind of stuff. And so when we say IoT security, it's actually similar to saying application pen testing as a whole of it's that big of a domain where things can flex and change, right? Because we could be talking about doing things like firmware analysis and reverse engineering of IoT devices. We could be talking about IoT devices that are connected to a network. And even when they're connected to a network, by what medium are they connected to the network, right? Are they connected, let's say, with regular old Wi-Fi, or are they connected with Bluetooth, or maybe something like Zigbee, right? Because that in itself, the connection mechanism is an area for vulnerabilities to creep up and for malicious actors to exploit those vulnerabilities, especially because IoT devices have a unique set of use cases and domains to them where maybe if it's wireless, being able to exploit that wireless nature to it uh, allows you to defeat the whole purpose and functionality of the device. For example, a home security system, right? So that being said, I compiled together a fantastic guide for you guys tonight that we're going to be jumping into. And again, this is a getting started. We'll likely have a part two and a part three down the line. But uh, really what I wanted to do is I wanted to get the fundamental baseline down of what are we looking at as a landscape for IoT security. So uh, as you guys know, we host up all of our content, by the way, on the CyberJudo site. So if you go under CyberJudo uh, training content and videos, you'll be able to find this here in reference to it. And soon enough, uh, after this recording is completed, I'll upload it to YouTube, I'll embed it in the site and all that kind of stuff too. This way you guys have the site content as well as the video all together in a nice, neat place. So that being noted, IoT. What does IoT mean? Well, we're all familiar with the concept of IoT, so I'm trying not to beat a dead horse or talk in too much of a layman's term, but Internet of Things is such a wide scope of devices and domains, and it's really intriguing because one of the things that people conventionally will think about IoT is that it is this new concept of devices of the last five years or maybe last 10 years, right? Uh, and that it is some bleeding edge thing. And indeed, uh, that is a misnomer. Um, so IoT has uh, a callback to a set of predecessors uh, that have been actually around for quite some time when it comes to industrial control systems and what we call SCADA systems. So you can imagine, for example, factories and uh, facilities that have to process, let's say, I don't know, utility uh, 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 facilities like uh, energy plants and, and all that kind of stuff. They need to have ways to monitor all the machines, all the infrastructure, everything that they're doing with all these sensors. And so this was actually a set of technologies that was being developed all the way back in the 1970s and the 1980s and the 1990s. And one of the most frequent protocols that's used in regular IoT devices today is called NQTT. And when people hear about it and we talk about how exploitable it is and how vulnerable it can be and, and all that kind of stuff, one of the things that people don't realize is that the first iteration of MQTT that was created, version one, was in 1999, right? That is the, the twinkle in the eye, right, of IoT devices. So uh, we all know that this is a domain that is becoming more and more uh, ubiquitous, and essentially everyone has IoT devices, not just in their homes, but now attached to their bodies and all types of things. Why is IoT so important compared to things like network infrastructure or server infrastructure, right? Well, there's a lot of good reasons. And there's a lot of 
different types of people who would be intrigued and interested in IoT security from different viewpoints and perspectives. Let's start with consumers. We're all consumers here. I'm sure all of us in one way or another leverage and utilize IoT devices or at least have some family members that do. Here's a little IoT device that I made. It's a little IoT camera. So all this does is it has a little PIR sensor, has a little camera on it, has a little screen, runs a little ESP32 processor on it that I can program with the Arduino IDE, right? And you can purchase these little boards and all that kind of stuff. We're usually anywhere from about $20, maybe $30 if you put a lot of money into it. And you know, I 3D printed a nice cute little case for myself here, right? So a device like this, a lot of people have things like this in their home that is using almost the same type of hardware, the same type of kit, very similar software. And uh, a lot of times you'll go to a place like Walmart or Target and you might buy a quick camera or a quick little device and it'll ask to connect to the Wi-Fi. And maybe you pull out your smartphone and you add in your wireless credentials and all that kind of stuff. Well, the thing is, that's really kind of interesting about these devices is that these devices call back to cloud infrastructure, to a home, so to speak, right? And a lot of the devices that you may purchase as a consumer uh, will use frameworks like the Tuya framework and the Tuya cloud. And Tuya uh, is a very specific technology cloud um, that is, for the most part, uh, developed by uh, Chinese companies and uh, the infrastructure in itself, uh, a, a good of majority of it is hosted in China. And obviously a lot of that data is collected and utilized by the um, Chinese state. So if we have a little IoT device that let's say uses the Tuya framework and the Tuya cloud, and we put it on our home network and it's deployed and it, the camera does its thing. Maybe you don't mind too much that someone might be spying on you through the camera, although it is very creepy and that kind of stuff. And I would say in its own right, is probably something for people to be considered of because you guys are familiar with extortion, right? And we all know about ransomware attacks and how ransomware attacks are a form of extortion. You guys have probably heard about extorting people for whatever nude pictures might exist of them or something like that that might come from an IoT device or a mobile device, that kind of stuff. But even aside of that, the thing is, is that this is a little backdoor into your homework or into your home network, right? So this device here calls back, even if you don't have any uh, ports open on your home firewall or anything like that inbound, right? Uh, it calls home to a cloud inf infrastructure environment. You use a mobile app on your phone, which talks to that same cloud, right? And this gets over the air updates and all that kind of stuff all the time that you may or may not know about. It doesn't require your authorization to get over the air updates. Anytime that whomever actually runs the cloud infrastructure behind it, they can push over the air updates without you knowing. And so these little devices are great for creating little backdoors into networks that you can actually do things like scanning the rest of the network, port scanning, right? Doing command and control, right? Exploiting vulnerabilities and weaknesses that are on the, uh, on the local network. Actually, there is a whole domain of IoT devices that's purposely built for pen testing that a lot of you guys actually might be familiar with. The Hack 5 gear, right? Like the Hack 5 LAN turtles, right? Uh, so you can get a Hack 5 like LAN turtle, uh, there are so many other devices like the packet squirrels and all that kind of stuff. And they actually have one of the complementary offerings to their hardware products. It's called the, the uh, uh, C2, right? So it's it's the Hack 5 C2, their command and control infrastructure. And you can deploy it in your own Azure or AWS environment for yourself. And so when you deploy out all your little IoT hacking devices as part of your maybe physical pen testing engagement or whatever, right? They call home to you and you can control them. And I think that provides a very good analogy to consumer devices, right? And what type of devices that you buy and deploy and, and that kind of stuff, right? These devices, again, don't just collect data that might be visual, but they can collect all types of data, like LIDAR data of uh, the mapping of people's houses, right? Also uh, getting into areas of what we call dark patterns that might be used by a lot of different technology providers where they're collecting information about you as a consumer that you may not know, and that's being used against you is not in your best interest. I think uh, perhaps talking about IoT and uh, with my uh, my colleague here, Travis, in the domain of uh, the, the military and his background in the military, a big whoopsie daisy that occurred many, many years ago was uh, essentially uh, a bunch of military personnel using devices like Fitbits. Oh, and yeah. Training. Yeah, you remember oh, that. That, that was a big deal. It was they were super popular and sometimes service members would do it when they get deployed. 
And when you're deployed, you still have to exercise. They would wear their Fitbits and they would run the perimeter of their bases. And you could see that anywhere. So these unpublished, not very well-known forward operating bases were just right there for ISIS. And they were targeted uh, several, several times because of that. It, they suspect, you know, tracking down exact OSINs is a little bit hard. But yeah, it it was a big deal. Yeah. So that's a, that's a perfect example of just, again, at the end user consumer level. Then you have enterprises. Well, certainly enterprises want to be considerate about IoT devices because, again, they exist as a perfect backdoor into en enterprise network infrastructure, which is why, at the end of the day, I do believe in the concept of as much as possible trying to practice zero trust principles, right? And as much as possible having security focus to the endpoints. But in reality, you you can't just focus to one domain or another. You have to have a set of comprehensive overlapping security controls in a defense in depth posture. So even as much as nowadays networks become less and less relevant and the perimeter becomes less and less relevant, still within conventional enterprises that use a lot of traditional network and server infrastructure, having things like network segregation with segregated VLANs in place, right? Makes a lot of sense to help block out these little devices, right? And so always, even for myself, from a consumer standpoint, I always put these on a different network. Anytime that I've ever had to create a network for an enterprise or a small business, I've always had a dedicated VLAN for IoT devices in themselves. This way, if one commander, uh, a, a device got uh, compromised by command and control cloud infrastructure or something like that, at least I've been containing the problem of it. And then also I can focus on having more security aggressive, uh, aggressive security controls to that particular VLAN. A good example being, and even if you didn't have any ACLs in place, the fact that if one of these little bad boys starts to do some really aggressive port scanning and ping sweeps across your network, once it starts to enter VLAN route to another network, right, or another VLAN within your network infrastructure environment, your intrusion prevention system and intrusion detection system is going to see that and start to block that, right? Or you'll get a notification about it at least and start to, you know, identify and contain the particular compromised device and threat actor. So enterprises are obviously, you know, find it particularly interesting. It's important to them securing their network perimeters, but also device manufacturers and, and makers. Everything is now connected to the cloud, right? Cars, toasters, fridges. This here is my own little version of a Google Home device that I make because obviously I don't trust Google. I don't trust Amazon or anything like that. This uses a little Raspberry Pi in a 3D printed case. It's a bit rough that I created where, hey, I can press the button or I can say, hey, Ezra, and it will process everything locally on the device, not sending anything to any cloud providers or anything like that. So I control the security of it. Uh, and so again, this is done with a lot of open source software and, and all that kind of stuff. By the way, in case any other IoT enthusiasts are here, what I particularly like to use on this software wise is called Mycroft, right? So they run a pretty good uh, stack there. They have a pretty good solution. And I think they start producing actual hardware for folks who are maybe not the tinkerer type, but they still mind privacy quite a bit. And device manufacturers, uh, particularly, uh, it's it's important for them because that's now a device that's deployed at scale. Uh, I've had the opportunity of doing IoT pen testing for organizations that are deploying consumer IoT devices into the home. And you can imagine that if you were a IoT consumer or an IoT device creator or a solution stack provider, right? Maybe you provide, I don't know, monitoring for a specific demographic of individuals, or maybe you provide a security home solution, or maybe you provide a sensor solution. If a malicious actor is able to reverse engineer your technology stack and your IoT devices and find a lot of great vulnerabilities and weaknesses in it, then what they're going to be able to do is start attacking all the consumers of your device. And when they start doing that, the consumers of your devices are going to be really unhappy and they're going to move to somebody else. I think a perfect example uh, was not too far back, maybe about two, two and a half years ago was, was Wise. They're a pretty popular IoT company nowadays. They were initially quite popular with the maker community and they're quite maker supported. Fortunately, they don't really uh, pander to that demographic anymore. But the fact of the matter is, is that I uh, the, the company Wise had a 
uh, series of whoopsie daisies and stints where they didn't really care about the security of their wise IoT devices and that got out there that actually really hurt their brand reputation. A lot of people moved away from them uh, and they did end up fixing a lot of the vulnerabilities and weaknesses and start taking it a bit more seriously. Um, the fact of the matter is, yeah, that's a shame too because their stuff's really good. I've used their $30 smartwatch for three years. It, it holds up. You know, Travis, I know that too because I have all the metrics and data for it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when it comes to uh, when it comes to IoT uh, devices uh, that are created by organizations, they in one degree or another have to care about the the security of the device at one point or another because consumers will be interested in trade, they'll become concerned, and they'll eventually move away from that solution. So there's that one point where it has a monetary impact to the wallet of those organizations. So that being said, we also, again, are talking about things like cars, right? All the time, I'm now hearing about like Hondas and the Teslas and all that kind of crazy stuff that you can do with those cars and being able to uh, uh, remotely start them, hijack them, break into them, that kind of stuff. Now, I will say, I've now been following the news that much on, I believe there was Honda and Hyundai, the most that I've been hearing the uh, in, in the news. I have not been able to follow to the specifics of those situations. Happy to kind of, you know, talk about that maybe towards the end if we pull up an article or two, but I can't really opine to the specifics of those. But that in itself is a huge domain because now you're taking a device that could be used for spying in the home and it's creepy and you're taking it and you're turning it into a multi-ton death machine that a malicious actor can take control over. At the end of the day, a Tesla is all electronic. Every element of it, the braking, the steering, the acceleration, if a malicious actor was able to compromise such a thing, right? It's not unforeseen to think that a state actor or something like that might be able to leverage that, I don't know, killing somebody or something, right? So that being said, like I was noting, the domain for IoT is really, really expensive. So you have device security, right? You have elements of the device security would include like the firmware, right? And being able to reverse engineer the firmware. The code that runs on it, it has to be as best as possible, protected and obfuscated, difficult to reverse engineer. Uh, uh, and also ensuring that there's good principles like not having hard-coded API keys and passwords within it, right? Otherwise, then the IoT device, if it gets compromised, let's say a gateway, I reverse engineer it and I find out that this IoT gateway that I have has admin and it has a set of backdoor credentials that was created by, I don't know, the developers for testing or something like that. And those credentials exist on every single gateway. Now we got a real problem, right? And obviously we've seen this all in the news and we've seen this with even a lot of like uh, cheaper consumer grade uh, routers and firewalls and that kind of stuff of backdoor credentials everywhere. And then malicious actor doesn't have to go through a series of, you know, really complex technical vulnerabilities and exploitation. They're just logging into a web interface, right? Um, we have uh, also elements of network security. Like I said, network can bridge many different mediums. Uh, a perfect example. Uh, so we were just talking about previously like Wi-Fi, but... I always like to talk about things like Zigbee and other RF communications. So let's say I have a little device that uh, connects to my door. It's a doorway sensor. So every time the door opens and closes, it tells me if the door is in an open state or a closed state. And it talks to the um, gateway, which is a security system. And I arm my security system at night so that if the door got open for one reason or another, my alarm goes off. We as consumers would expect that all to occur. We'd expect that intruder trying to break into our home. We would get a notification or alert or something would sound off. So we have at least a, another minute of time to help protect ourselves, protect our family, so on and so forth. But what if, for example, a malicious actor did something like that RF signal? Every time the sensor gets tripped, it sends a notification over RF over the waves, right? It's not talking all the time. It's not using a keep alive. It just sends a signal, hey, my state has changed, right? Hey, it's open. Hey, it's closed. What if we drown out that RF frequency with a software defined radio? One that we could purchase for 20 to $30 on, on Amazon. And we drown out that particular frequency of RF where 
the gateway can't sense the device that's talking and sending a notification. It's too encumbered with the rest of the RF noise. So now we've essentially created a jammer device, right? And that's actually one of the challenges and problems with a lot of home uh, security systems that people may have is that it uses usually an RF frequency, right? To just briefly notify if the state of a window or a door is closed or open. And you could use a software defined radio to jam a set of frequencies, right? And then break into someone's home and they would never have any clue. Then the gateway and the security system wouldn't be any smarter to think that the door was actually open the entire time, right? So that's a practical example of network security at a physical level. But obviously, when we talk about network security, then you can get into the logical level, right? Of uh, Does this have a web UI to it? Uh, does this have things like a maybe MQTT open on it, where we can send notifications and we can manipulate the device with MQTT? Maybe it has... Um, it's a video camera and maybe it has a video feed that's open on it. We can connect to the video feed over the logical network as long as we're on the same network. So if we break into the Wi-Fi, right? Those are other elements of that. Uh, IoT cloud API security. So as a device is talking back to its cloud provider and the cloud infrastructure, that's particularly important as well. The reason being is that that could be manipulated, that could be disrupted. You can hijack the uh, the those communications through a man and mill attack, right? And uh, perhaps subvert some of what you would again expect for things like notifications because a lot of times a device may see something or get a notification about it send it out to the cloud and then the cloud actually notifies your phone sends a push notification to your phone so that might be another way to interrupt it disrupt it that kind of stuff and then obviously application security testing of the iot device in itself right so very similar to the firmware but rather than the firmware in reverse engineering it and doing static analysis of the firmware and the code right dynamic application of the application and as the firmware is running on the device so that being noted uh one of the things i wanted to compile for folks was again it's some important iot terminology and i wanted to make a fairly uh helpful compendium beyond just these initial components here so you guys can see that this goes on quite a bit so i'm not going to get into everything because again this is more of a fundamentals session uh tonight uh and also i don't think we'll be able to cover the entire compendium of all the the entire lexicon that i provided there but i want to talk about particularly just uh three interesting things, which is, so first MQTT, we're going to talk about this more in just a moment, but it is probably the most common and ubiquitous protocol that's used for IoT devices to talk to one another on a shared network and environment, right? So light bulbs talking to one another, one another. you guys have probably had it in the past where you may have an, IO, uh, an app on your phone and you will go to have a bunch of light bulbs, a group of light bulbs, right? all changed to the same color or to the same scene at the same time. How do they do that? Well, they would essentially do that through, you know, a protocol like MQTT, which is mostly leveraging broadcast traffic to send commands to these devices. And we'll talk about the model and how MQTT works with, you know, um, essentially uh, subscribers and topics and all that kind of stuff in just a quick moment. Uh, but that is one of the primary protocols we're going to be talking uh, about and diving into. Uh, and then also SCADA. So one of the uh, things I was just talking about a little bit previously was some of the types of organizations and individuals uh, who might be interested in securing IoT devices. Talked about consumers, we talked about enterprises, we talked about device makers. You know what's a really big one? Infrastructure. Infrastructure, utility, right? Utilities like water treatment facilities, power plants, right? Um, those are facilities that are governed by a lot of IoT infrastructure and devices, right? And SCADA is essentially a pseudo predecessor, right, and of, of, of what you would think of conventional IoT. So supervisory control and data acquisition systems. So SCADA infrastructure doesn't as frequently use things like MQTT. They usually will use other types of uh, communication technologies, uh, usually what we call message-oriented oriented middleware or MOM protocols. But that being said, these SCADA systems and industrial control systems, if they are you know, broken into by a state actor or even somebody who is just so inclined to be disruptive, right? they could do things like 
disrupt water treatment facilities and throwing off chemical balance levels and trying to poison a population of individuals or something. And by the way, this is not me coming up with like a hypothetical thing. These are things that have actually occurred where the you know uh, authorities were able to catch the malicious actor in the process of doing this and prevent it from causing a major catastrophe, right? And affecting a large populace. I think it was, uh, I want to say like 2020 or 2019 was the last time I heard about a big water treatment facility getting hacked and somebody was trying to po poison the local water supply, right? So again, that's something very important to be privy of because at the end of the day, you may have lonesome malicious actors that are interested in doing that, but certainly state actors, your Russia, your China, I mean, these wars have been going on for quite some time. So a lot of infrastructure is already compromised and they're just wait, you know, people just kind of wait to strike for the right moment. But IoT device is one of the primary ways to do that. Now, by the way, malicious actors could leverage IoT devices and what I've already described to you, but we can also, even if we had no intent and disrupting infrastructure, disrupting enterprises, disrupting individuals or spying on individuals, that we can still monetize IoT devices as a set of malicious actors who wants to run a fairly good business. Well, how would that occur? Well, has anyone heard of the Miri botnets? Ah, so, or Miri or Mariah, I'm bad with the English language. That being said, the fact is, is that you can use a lot of IoT devices that at scale deployed across hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of homes that can act as bots for coordinated denial service attacks, right? That are massively distributed, not just across one locality or another, right? But entire countries. So if, for example, we had a bunch of micro tick devices that were particularly vulnerable to a set of attacks and we were able to compromise them and we just let our command and control malware lay dormant into that IoT device, we just don't have it do anything. And then when maybe as a malicious actor, I want to monetize that, I can have a service that's a pay for distributed denial of service attacks service. And then somebody pays me X amount in whatever cryptocurrency, and they provide a couple IP addresses. And then my command and control infrastructure sends that command to a bunch of these little IoT bots. They all send those commands out. They'll hit a... That, that infrastructure, they'll take that infrastructure down, they'll compromise the availability of those systems. And hey, that's not too bad, right? For a bunch of dumb IoT devices that were running essentially a bunch of default credentials on them. Um, so that's one of the important things to be very considerate of is that malicious actors can leverage it in that way. So as we talk more and more and more about IoT security and how that may compare to the security of network infrastructure and server infrastructure and all that kind of stuff, what we're finding is, well, because it's deployed everywhere, because it can be deployed by almost anybody, because there's no regulatory frameworks or controls that really require these devices to be that much more secure, at least not in the United States as of right now. Although I did hear about some legislation trying to be passed for it, and I think that there is some progress being made towards that. Let's see if that I mean that actually happens if people actually follow the legislation and regulation around it. That's a whole different deal. But the fact is, is that it's the ubiquity of it that I think makes it particularly problematic in the volume of it, right? In the ease of being able to identify vulnerable IoT devices and take control over them, that makes it a little bit more concerning, you know, uh, when you start to think about it in a greater, um, you know, context. So when it comes to IoT, there's a lot of different frameworks. There's a lot of different things that we can kind of leverage in this particular domain. And so we got IoT top 10. So again, everyone talks about OWASP, OWASP all day long, right? But a lot of times people don't realize that there's a lot of different awesome OWASP community projects, right? And one of them that doesn't get enough love is honestly the OWASP IoT uh, top 10 uh, project. Uh, there's also the IoT uh, GOAT uh, project, which is essentially... You know, people are very familiar with things like Juice Shop, right? So, hey, with Juice Shop, you can have a purposely vulnerable web application that you can do security testing on and you can kind of play with and leverage that kind of stuff. Well, what if you want to do it for IoT devices? Well, they have something for that. We can actually deploy a virtual machine for that. That's basically an, a 
uh, open WRT uh, device and appliance that is purposely vulnerable and we can kind of poke and prod on it and see what we can do with it. Obviously, when we talk about IOA, uh, IoT top 10, weak guessable hard-coded credential sits at the top, right? That was originally the main mechanism for so many IoT devices becoming compromised and leading to these massive botnets. It's been getting slightly better, but in all honesty, it's still a really significant issue because now, yeah, maybe you don't have a web interface where you type in admin admin and log into the device immediately or anything like that. But the thing is, is that now we have protocols like MQTT that a lot of times you can subscribe to a topic with a username and password that might be admin admin, take over the device through MQTT or other protocols, uh, or uh, just the fact that a device may have a backdoor on it, or it may have still SSH open on it, and maybe you can't get the credentials, but if you take the time to reverse engineer uh, the firmware on them, then you find the hard-coded credentials that were left by developers for testing or something like that, or for operators, and now you can then leverage that, right? Uh, and uh, next one, insecure network services that goes along with things like MQTT. Man, I have pen tested com commercial IoT devices that have had Telnet open to the internet, right? IoT devices, by the way, that have had not just regular Ethernet and you plug it into like your home network and you're like, well, no worries. The device is not directly connected to the internet, but this is the thing. They would have sailor cards in them too. So of course it was connected directly to the internet with Telnet and credentials of root root. Okay. My, ba my baby monitor had Telnet connected to the internet when I plugged it in. No shit. <laughs> no, oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Uh, so the question is, are you still using it though? Yeah, but that's blocked. Oh, okay. Well, it works fine. It works it's fine other than that. Imagine um, how scary that is for the unlearned person, right? That's why it's such a problem. It's just they're they're so difficult to secure. They are, and and, and that, well, a, a lot of times people are not particularly privy to it, uh, and then when they start to become privy to it, you know, not not being able to understand the, the different and various layers to uh, how a malicious actor might be able to compromise a device like that. For example. You know, we were just talking about baby monitors, and I, I remember hearing many, many times in the news, some disgusting freak breaks in, into someone's home network, right? They break into the baby monitor, and they start screaming at the kid in the middle of the night. Just weird, awful things like that. But uh, a practical example would be security systems. So a security gateway, a lot of times what people will do is they'll have a security gateway connected to a sailor modem. Why? Well, what if the internet goes down, right? Makes sense for your security solution. A lot of security solutions have had sailor backups for many, many years. It makes a lot of sense. So now you have an IoT gateway with those sensitive insecure protocols and credentials, that kind of stuff with a, a sailor backup or gateway on it. And now you have a malicious actor who can access your security system from you know anywhere in the world. Uh, lack of secure, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, insecure ecosystem interfaces. So the insecure ecosystem interfaces being, how is it getting over there? Updates, cloud communication and, 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 um, and, and notifications. Th same things when it goes to the insecure update uh, mechanism. Uh, OTA, over the air updates. Uh, you can do that uh, with a lot of these really great ESP32 devices. By the way, I've been showing these off. These are one of my favorites. Um, these are, um, they're called M5 stacks. They will run little um, uh, ESP32 uh, processors on them. They're very easy to program with the uh, Arduino IDE. And as just a very brief tangent for uh, everybody here, I'm sure some of you folks are kind of like in the, uh, the crowd of uh, doing things like, uh, uh, is a battery done on this one? There we go. Uh, doing things like uh, wireless de-authing attacks, right? And doing wireless pen testing and whatnot. And so I got this one here that is running Packet Monster and it's scanning through all my channels and it's collecting packets and I can start having it de-auth things, right? So this is a great little like alternative to leveraging like a Raspberry Pi or, uh, you know, leveraging like a... Um, I want to get one of them. What, what are the, the dolphin devices? What are they called? Flippers. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Flippers. So flipper zeros. So flipper zeros. So flipper zeros. Uh, they, uh, a lot of times what people do is they'll actually connect up an ESP32 for de thing for them. So this is a great little thing. Like if you can't get your hands on a flipper yet, or maybe you don't want to drop uh what is it? How much is a flipper, Mike? 
Oh, they're like 215 now. And then yeah, I, they're I the dev board. The dev board is like 40. They're real fun. So. They're they're super fun, but you know, this is a you know, smaller barrier entry if you're like 30 to 50 bucks here. But that being said, and those, by the way, in their own right and own domain, and I know I'm getting off on a tangent, but are really helpful when we talk about IoT security. Actually, maybe as a very again brief tangent, but I think it's a cool tangent, Mike. Some of the really cool things that we can do with them. And those I those those little IT devices is things like replicating RFID batches, right? We can also yeah. do frequency replay attacks. So we can do an RF replay attack. So uh, a, a really simple one. And um, depending on the type of car, there are different security mechanisms for RFID remotes. But a very simple one is like the Teslas. They have a, a charging port uh, that gets covered automatically. And that charging port, if you want to open it up, you can open it up with your charger pressable button. And it's a, just a little general radio frequency emitter, right? And it'll open up the charging port, right? Um, there's no security for that, right? Understandably, it's not that big of a deal, right? But with a Flipper Zero, what you could do is you could capture, right? That uh, command, right? Over RF, right? Then replay. And so what you could do is you could go to your local, like, I don't know, uh, Target or something like that, where everyone's got all their Teslas, right? And then just keep replaying it all over the place. And you got a bunch of cars that are flapping in the wind, you know? Uh, Mike, do you want to elaborate to any other cool, neat features uh, as you've been, like, investigating? Uh, playing oh, with them? My goodness, it is a uh, it is an intense, scary tool, um, one that should be taken with extreme grain of salt with what you're doing. Um I play around with it on my own things because I have not ventured out into the realm of messing with other RFIDs. Uh, I can start my car with it. It's a remote start. Very, very scary stuff. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> so you were able to do the remote start on your car? Because, yes, you know, they're, suppo they're supposed to be like a turning interval, right? And an integer mm -hmm. on those. So you're not supposed to be able to replay those. Um, well, you can. Wow. What car do you got? <laughs> 2017 Chevy Cruze. Oh, wow. We okay. So it sounds like uh, we'll have to have a future uh, session on Cyber Judo. Yeah, it's it's done through an application on my phone called My Chevrolet, and it's it's done that way, and that's how I was able to replay the attack through through the actual um, phone. So very nice, <laughs> very you interesting. Know, yeah. What we'll have to do is, and again, my apologies for the tangent here, team, but we'll have to do a session on the Flipper Zeros fairly soon. And when we go to do that, um, I'll have a, a, like a quick predecessor lineup to when I'm on vacay and traveling, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, where in the world is Christian Scott, where people go to hunt me down and figure out my geolocation. And you guys might think it's easy pulling the XF metadata, but it's going to be much more fun than that. But you want to know what? I will give out two flipper zeros, okay, to whomever can find me wherever I am in the world. So I'll have that posted on LinkedIn in a couple of weeks for everybody. Just as a fun challenge. I like to have a little bit of fun, you know? Did you, did you see when I did that? Oh, like about uh, we'll be four or five months ago when I went to a trip to Mexico, right? And I said, hey, find me, you know? And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, everyone was, and then this one guy who was super great at OSINT, right? Sends me a PM. He's like, you're in this room. You're at this hotel. You're at this latitude and longitude. And I'm like, okay, you and I cannot be friends anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so the next thing you hear is like knock 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 yeah oh fuck um i was actually inspired by that but i'm gonna have a little bit more fun and i'm gonna try to i think you may have gave, given too many clues we'll have to see i'm gonna chat about you oh i did for sure so anyway so c continuing on here so um again a lot of different uh information that i compile for you guys in regards to uh, OWASP IoT materials, right? So they have information on the IoT vulnerabilities project, attack service areas project, medical devices. Oh, wow, we, I didn't get the opportunity to talk about medical devices. Talk about the things that you could do with IoT insulin pumps. Yeah. So you can see how that could get really deep really quickly and be quite concerning, especially if leveraged by uh, the wrong types of folks, particularly state actors. So <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to talk about more specifically, let's get into uh, understanding the MQTT protocol a little bit, how it works, because this is one of the fundamental aspects of starting to uh, jump into IoT pen testing. So first and foremost, so I MQTT, is essentially a protocol for 
not just being able to con uh, 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 configure and get information from one device, but a group of devices as well. And so when you think about it in that way, that's why it's architected with this whole thought process of what we call publishers, brokers, and subscribers, and we have things like topics. So think about it this way for a moment. So a publisher is essentially like a client that sends a message about a particular topic. For example, light state is one topic and light color is another topic. If the light state changes from on to off, or if the light color changes from blue to red, right? Those are topics that we can subscribe to as a IoT device, maybe as a light bulb, let's say, that's particularly interested in those topics because those topics are used as almost like commands, right? We can also have subscribers that receive information from those topics. So we could have it where maybe a gateway is the publisher to the topic of lights on or off, right? And then all of our light bulbs are the subscribers. And when they subscribe to that topic and they get uh, a notification that the lights are now off for the lights state topic, they will then respond to it and they will turn off. Fairly straightforward in that regard. Again, a topic is essentially just literally a topic. Something is of a particular interest. Very frequently, I like to think of it as like a, a control variable, you know? Uh, so again, you could be what temperature it is, what are color of the lights, are the lights on and off? Uh, is my camera on or off? Did my camera just detect motion or not? Very frequently, devices that have things like PIR sensors, they will actually use topics. And uh, they'll use a topic and publish to that topic, hey, I just detected a motion. They'll publish to a topic, I just detected a motion. And then the gateway is subscribing to it. And the gateway gets a notification, hey, this this camera just saw that there was motion, start recording, right? Another good example would be, like I was talking about with a door sensor earlier, a door sensor would be publishing to a particular topic about the door state. And when the door state is now open, right? It publishes that and the gateway picks that up. The gateway can then react to it. And then we have a broker, which is essentially the server that will manage the connections and the distribution of those messages. Usually your gateway device will also act as your, what we call MQTT broker. And so here's a really great diagram of that process occurring where we have a client A and client B, they're talking to this broker, they're publishing topics. This is broadcast traffic, so everyone else can see it. That's how you get a bunch of light bulbs, by the way, to all react all at the same time. You know, if we are using unicast traffic to communicate to each single light bulb at the same time, it can get very, very difficult for those devices to all orchestrate the same activities at the same time. So broadcast traffic is much more efficient for that. That's why, by the way, anyone who tries to have, let's say, a gateway of an IoT device and light bulbs for your, uh, in, your, in your environment on two different VLANs, it doesn't work too well because they're in different broadcasting domains. They're on different subnets, right? So what are some of the concerns of MQTT if we start to think about it and we talk about it? Well, first and foremost, like I said, it was a protocol that was originally created in 1999. Anything that's at all wasn't built with security architecture in mind. So first and foremost, this clear text communications and eavesdropping is a huge element to some security woes and concerns about MQTT. Believe it or not, MQTT, when it was first created, did not have any type of authentication me mechanism to it. It now does support, obviously, uh, authentication uh, for it. Um, the authentication mechanism that does exist now, funny enough though, is MQTT does not use encryption in transit by default. It's a clear text protocol. And this is the thing. When you work with some of these little devices here, um, they have some limitations when it comes to encryption. It can be a bit taxing on these devices. And so uh, a lot of developers and manufacturers will essentially have to the white side, even though they can implement TLS on these devices and they can have the MQTT topics all communicating within TLS and all that kind of stuff, they'll forego that because it makes the devices slower. 
right? Puts a little bit too much strain on them, right? It may decrease the amount of features and functionality of the devices. It may require really clean, consistent, and tight programming where maybe they just want to slap together some MVP code and get it out the door, right? And so you'll get to see fun things like this, where when someone goes to authenticate, you can see it just on the clear text network. Oh, that's very helpful. And then you can just help yourself into the rest of the infrastructure and rest of the environment. Unauthorized access to brokers is another big one. Message tampering and interception. If there's topics out there and anyone can subscribe to a topic, right? And anyone can be a publisher to a topic if there's no authentication in place, that means you can start messing with somebody's light bulbs in their house. It means you might be able to start messing with things like their locks. You might be able to start messing with the state of what it seems like their doors are, right? And so if you, if, let's say, broke into someone's wireless home network, which is not particularly difficult if anyone's using WPA2. Oh my God. I mean, WPA2 is an absolutely horrific protocol on its own, especially if you're using pre-shared keys. If you're not using AO2NX authentication, right, with WPA2, likely you have a home wireless network that's going to be easily compromised with somebody who has maybe a little bit of half with a graphics card, right? But that's a whole different topic for another day. But once you break into someone's home wireless network, then what you can do is most of them are flat v uh, uh, flat networks. It's all on the same VLAN. It's all on the same subnet and that kind of stuff. So you're going to see all that broadcast traffic. You're going to see all the MQTT communications, right? And then you could start hunting down the port for MQTT. So the port for that bad boy, right, is 18 uh, or uh, 1833. Or I'm sorry, 1883. So what's really interesting about that is uh, I think Travis, you were talking about your uh, your baby monitor, right? And mm -hmm. how when you first connected it up, it just had like a bunch of things like Telnet open on it and whatnot. If we open up, let's say something like, I don't know, let's open up Shodan here, team. Let's have some fun. Shodan, for anyone who doesn't know, this is like the Google, right, of devices on the internet. Google indexes metadata of content on websites. Shodan, in services also similar to it, like census, index devices that are on, connected to the internet. So their IP addresses, what ports are there, and then it'll try to collect service banners, all that kind of stuff. So we can do some really interesting searches across the interwebs here. And let's just look for everything that has that port open on it. So that, uh, there we go, 1883. And, ooh, wowee, let's see what we're getting here. Hmm. Hmm. Ah, MQTT connections here. Ah, and look at these. These devices are just putting out what topics they have. And we could just click through these and look through them all day long of what devices are out on the internet with MQTT. And we could actually start sending traffic to them. And we could start tr trying to subscribe to topics and manipulate them all day long. There's all types of interesting devices that you can kind of browse through. And by the way, I would not recommend, this is looking right now, this is passive, right? This is completely fine to do. The moment you start to talk to someone else's IP address, that's where it becomes gray. That's where I recommend that you don't do, uh, or you don't, you don't move any further. But what we can see is a lot of MQTT here. I'm actually gonna just filter it down specifically to MQTT so I can just see all that fun traffic. A lot of these seem to be, blank topics, but I bet we could probably find some interesting ones soon enough. So I think a little bit earlier, I was browsing around. Oh, look, active MQ. Ah, okay. So that that's an interesting one. I'm not going to touch that one, but uh, previously, I actually saw someone uh, hosting some uh, AWS IoT infrastructure, which was very, very concerning and, uh, and whatnot, but I'm not going to keep digging. I don't want to beat a dead horse here. That being said, wow, we almost 400,000 devices have MQTT open directly on the internet now. There's a lot of devices that have things like cellular gateways on them and all that kind of stuff. And that's one of the initial ways that you can jump into the IoT device and compromise it and start to laterally move. Now, in that process, uh, again, you can tamper with messages, intercept them. You can also they have poor access controls. They have poor authentication mechanisms beyond the default credentials 
right? Even sometimes they'll uh, implement them uh, where it seems like there's some level of security here, but uh, a lot of times they'll use, uh, again, backdoor credentials for uh, o OTA updates. Oh, they'll use hard-coded API keys. They'll be talking to infrastructure. I've actually had scenarios where I've performed um, pen testing for IoT providers and IoT infrastructure where they actually hard-coded credentials that were used by all of the IoT gateways across their entire cloud infrastructure environment, which means that we could actually compromise the integrity, availability, and confidentiality of the entire IoT cloud. We were able to register our own devices. We were able to claim devices that didn't exist. We were able to claim other people's devices and take over their devices. It can get really, really problematic when people hard code API keys directly into the IoT devices. So that being noted, I wanna take just a quick brief break here. Is there any big questions, uh, Travis, that we've had come in that we should address? Uh, Mike Dennis and I have been going through um, pretty quick. I'm not sure that there's a current one in here that's been unaddressed. Dennis addressed one, but it it may it may serve purpose to have you address it again because it's it's an excellent question by Yuri, who uh, says, "Do you create your own IoT pen test devices, and should you know electronics, soldering, reading schematics, et cetera, at a high level?" Christian, ah, that's a really fantastic question. So. I'm a tinkerer at heart, so I always recommend that people have the opportunity to always deep dive into something. But I also know that not everyone uh, has the time uh, or necessarily maybe the appetite for that type of aptitude uh, to dive into soldering things. So what I would say by minimum is this, is that it doesn't hurt to take some of the crap IoT devices that we've purchased in the past, because we've all purchased things like that in the past. Keep it around. Don't throw it in the trash, right? Put it on a VLAN of your security lab, right? This way you have the opportunity to start playing with it and breaking it down, that kind of stuff. I don't think that it hurts also to crack something up and reverse engineer it. So for example, if I may, one second here, good team. Oh no, he's going off podcast camera. podcast or something. <laughs> going oh, right, uh, like fucking uh, carrot top over here, pulling another thing out of his bag of tricks and all that. So. One of the things you guys have been seeing me hold is this little Next router, right? And this little Next router, uh, many, many years ago, uh, was a device that I found um, a lot of uh, cogen facilities deploying. A cogen facility, by the way, uh, we got a lot of them in Manhattan. Essentially, uh, when it comes to like uh, power and the utilization of power in the city, uh, depending on what time of the day it is, you're going to pay a different rate for your electricity. So a lot of times what people will do is they will use these cogeneration facilities to run during the day during peak hours, right, in Manhattan or in a city, right, to reduce the cost of their electricity, reduce their bills. And um, you can also, with those cogen facilities, sell electricity back to the grid and all that kind of stuff. But you got to monitor those cogen facilities, right? So I used to work with a lot of engineers that would create these or architect these cogen facilities. They would deploy them. They would, you know, have them on top of skyscrapers and all kind of stuff. But they got to, you know, monitor. Hey, what's the, you know, uh, viscosity of the fluid running through these pipes? And you know, are these fans running and all that kind of stuff? And they used to hook up a bunch of these with sailor gateways and that kind of stuff, right? And these little next routers, they were about at the time, I want to say $35 or something like that. And by the way, you can't already tell on the back, the password is admin admin. Uh, yeah, so very unique there. And so uh, I took the opportunity of cracking the device open and reverse engineering them and playing with them. They're very intriguing devices uh, because these run a particularly really insecure and vulnerable version of OpenWRT. So uh, it was, uh, again, really interesting opportunity of reverse engineering them. I recommend that when somebody has some uh, extra old equipment lying around to crack it open, take a look around. Uh, one of the things I was speaking about a little bit uh, above that I think I got ahead of myself because there's just so much in the domain of IoT, but is a JTAG. And so basically what a JTAG is, is it's an interface that'll exist on these devices for programming them, debugging, testing, and all that kind of stuff, right? And so, you know, you can usually find on these devices a little JTAG pinout. This one has a 
where's the little pinout for this one here? Uh, that actually the hilariously enough, the JTAG pinout is is actually on the same USB port that's used to power it. Funny enough, so you can like reprogram them over the USB. Very like simple in this particular case and regard, but. Uh, when you crack open a device, you can start to play with the JTAG. You can essentially use a uh, a USB to a serial device to connect to it and actually read the bitstream, read the firmware, start to play with it. Um, there's even a lot of great ways to extract the firmware and to manipulate the device as it's running through the JTAG. Um, so uh, I do recommend having the opportunity of playing with things. I would say soldering is always a great thing to pick up. Um, there's nothing like getting a couple of burns on your fingertips, uh, third degree burns in particular. Uh, it's just, it's a character building activity. Uh, and I would say that uh, it Raspberry Pis, they got too expensive now. There's just a huge, for some reason, like spike in the pricing of, of them. There are so many great alternatives now. I would say start some, with something sim, uh, a little even more simple, like the ESP32s or ESP8266s uh, are really easy to program with uh, the Arduino IDE. Uh, you can even, if you're crazy like me and you like Python this much, you can run micro Python on them or circuit Python if you want something that's really inefficient, you know? Um, and again, you're like me, uh, but... Um, it's not required to get good at IoT pen testing, but it's certainly helpful. And I think it'll help help differentiate somebody, um, especially when you encounter unique gateways where you may have to rip out the or pull off the firmware. Uh, I think that that's going to be probably your areas of most trouble is doing for firmware reverse engineering and static analysis of the firmware to find um, encoded like secrets, that kind of stuff. Um, Dennis, did you want to elaborate any? To any of that, because I know that this is a domain that you really enjoy as well. Oh, uh, off the top of my head, I, I was just surprised you'd mentioned some of the uh, some of the slightly, I believe, slightly more efficient uh, implementations for IoT, like Lua devices that you can sometimes have, uh, since it you know runs a little closer to uh, a little closer to C than Python, but. Uh, yeah, no, I, I don't have too much to say as far as that goes. Um, I, I think uh, I think you've you've covered it pretty well so far. Um, I, I I'm more of a, a to the point of the uh, uh, topic earlier that Yuri was bringing up. Uh, I'm more of a reverse engineering guy, right, rather than going into my own hardware. So um, typically, you know, I'll rip something apart and then figure out how it works and then base it off that. So uh, can't can't give too much as far as development goes, unfortunately. So, you know what? I think I have something that I can share with you guys, and I will share this after our session. So, here's an old copy. Um, so, our firm, Gotham Security, we do a lot of pen testing, guys, right? Uh, and uh, again, we get to do a lot of fun stuff with IoT. I, I have a redacted sample report that I'll update our guide with for, for everybody. And I think this will be really helpful of taking guys step by step by step through some of the pen testing that we've done. This is a particular example, by the way, of a IoT platform that we pen tested. So we, we pen tested the, the mobile application, the API that the mobile application calls to, the API gateway, the IoT devices, or did I say API gateway, IoT gateway, the IoT devices that talk to the gateway, and then the underlying backend IoT infrastructure. So the, that middleware that helps orchestrate some of the communications uh, between all the devices. And, you know, uh, again, uh, just because we're a little bit short on time here and you know, we'll be doing more of this in part two and part three, but we took the time to reverse engineer it and pull it apart, right? And pull the, the you know, get, grab the JTAG, pull the firmware off the device. And then after we were able to pull the firmware off the device, we actually found things like hard-coded credentials and secrets. If I just kind of jump ahead of myself here, yeah, statically configured public SSH key. Yeah, baby. You know, uh, what else do we have here? Lack of authentication on the IoT gateway web interface, again, connected to cellular. So I'll make sure that uh, what we do for you guys is we'll disseminate this sample report too in the Cyber Judo uh, training content. Again, I'll update it in the next like uh, day or so. But this way you guys have the opportunity to kind of really digging in and seeing what goes into a IoT pen testing engagement end to end, you know? Any other good questions that we have? No? 
Wow, we well, if not, I'd like to do a preview of uh, next week's session, explain a little bit what that's going to be. You don't mind? Yeah, that would be fantastic. Here, I'll stop the screen sharing and you can jump right into cool. it. So next week, we're going to go over the intro to kind of to Azure and Microsoft 365. What it's not is it's not me walking you through, you know, this is what the cloud is for. This is SaaS. This is that infrastructure as a service. There are way better people on YouTube like John Savile and everyone else who already have that content. What we're going to talk about is we'll take a look at what are the different licenses and it kind of dispel how confusing that is just for a second. And then the rest of it's going to be a scenario based. So I'm going to, I'll make some diagrams of actual real kill chains that I have done during pen tests that could be from password spraying into MFA bypass into being able to demonstrate um, exfiltrating data. It might be something like a spear phishing attack and then MFA bypass and then spidering around through there. And we're going to take a look at what are the options to create a good defense in depth strategy just with the Microsoft Cloud platform, um, just with uh, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, Defender for Cloud, all those different products, how they can work together. How can we, can, how can we set up really cool things like impossible travel detection, domain impersonation, all those sorts of things. So it is going to be not a super high level. It's not going to be we're not going to go crazy into configuring a perfect security architecture. As an intro, what we're going to do is talk about the different security concepts and tools and techniques that we can that, that can be implemented to mitigate a lot of those really common kill chains. And then in part two down the line, then we'll get into showing how to uh, configure that and set it up with, with a test uh, subscription in Azure. Stupendous. That sounds like it's going to be an absolutely fun one, especially because it applies very practically to a lot of small businesses and enterprise. Uh, and honestly, at the end of the day, uh, what I've seen is a lot of enterprises, even though these are practical things, still haven't deployed them, right? And a lot of organizations have relied far too much on things like multi-factor authentication as a, you know, uh, something that's foolproof when malicious actors have now been able to essentially improve the sophistication of their techniques of bypassing MFA relatively easily nowadays. We do it all the time, by the way, guys, bypassing gauges. MFA ain't got shit on anybody anymore, right? And so the compensating controls that you're able to leverage and deploy in things like Office 365 and in Azure, right, will really help be able to detect malicious actors gaining a foothold into a user's account, starting to perform yeah. lateral movement, it, 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 unusual behavior detection, all that. It's fairly rare, especially when we're doing phishing. If we get the username and password, most of the time we can bypass the MFA, like almost every time. Uh, but there are definitely ways that could stop us dead in our tracks, or at least make it tremendously more difficult. And that's what we're going to be end up, That's what we're going to be talking about next week. Awesome. Well, then to that team, thank you so much for your time tonight. We really appreciate it. We'll get this posted up uh, no later than Friday, and we catch you on the next Cyber Judo next Wednesday. Bye now. Thanks, everyone.